well, blessed be God. The song says, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. God bless you and welcome to your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson and welcome to Thursday School, which is Sunday School on Thursday. And here we are in the second Sunday of June of 2024, June the 9th, and our subject is Bold Ministers. And we're continuing our studies in the writings of the great apostle Paul. And we're in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 18. And we'll be reading um, our scriptures, most of them in the ESV English Standard Version. We want you to know these recordings are available on our various social media platforms 24 hours a day. We invite you, friends, family, amen, Bible study groups, accountability groups, to review uh, these studies at any time going back as much as four years. Amen. Uh, will you at least tell two people this week about Thursday School? And will you give a thumbs up, like, and share this video? It will make such a difference to help us reach more souls for Christ. And we're excited that we do have uh, various benevolent works around the world. You're welcome to go to our uh, website, www.djmd for DevonJacksonMD.org, djmd.org, to see the works, the orphanage in India that we're involved with, we were able to dig a well in Zambia. Um, and just recently, um, we were able to send well over a hundred Bibles to uh, American servicemen that are deployed in various places around the world. Um, there's a, the American Bible Society, I was so moved to learn they receive requests every day, every day for uh, American servicemen, whether they be uh, sailors or whether they be airmen or whether they be um, soldiers, Marines, they re receive requests every day for Bibles. And they have those that have information that is specific to their circumstances to encourage them. So just in the last, within the last month, we were able to send over a hundred Bibles and we're grateful for that. Uh, we've had outreach with the homeless and uh, various other things, and we're excited that more things are to come. <laughs> God's good to us. So we bless God. Lord, we love you. Thank you for my brothers, sisters, and friends that have joined us for the study of the word of God. Teach us. Have your way. Make us new. Open our eyes. Take away the veil. Help us to receive. Help us to say and live. Yes, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Well, in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 5, glory to God. It says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Our sufficiency is from God. It's from God. So we're to give all the honor and the glory to him. Sufficiency is the ability, the capability. Um, every ability that we have is from the mercy of the Lord, whether it be considered something that's actually a talent or whether it is just our physical body having the mobility, uh, the activity of our, of our limbs to be active, the opportunities to serve, all of it. Uh, every good and every perfect gift, the scripture says, it comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow turning. Every good and perfect gift, it comes from God, and we owe him the glory. Hallelujah. We honor people, but we glorify God. There's a difference. Verse 6 says, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant? Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. A minister is a servant. And here, specifically serving the word of God to the people. Um, and of course, that service can be the proclamation, the preaching. It can be teaching, which is sort of in bite-sized pieces, breaking down the food, like you feed a child in small pieces. And then as they're a little more mature, they can handle a little more difficult things. And then the scripture speaks about us uh, in the beginning. We're desiring the sincere milk of the word. And then later, the Apostle Paul talks about strong meat. So teaching is delivering uh, the food, the word of God, the bread of life in pieces and in manners that the audience can receive it. And we should always customize our teaching according to the audience. Whereas preaching is the wide proclamation of the gospel 
the picture of someone reaching in a seat pouch and throwing the seat out. All kind of recipients out there, but some of them, their heart will be good ground. So he's a minister of what? Of the New Testament, right? People are out there preaching and teaching a lot of things, but this is of the New Testament. And he goes on to say, uh, New Testament, because Testament and Covenant, those words mean the same thing. New Testament, New Covenant. But he gets specific. He says, because the letter kills, no spirit brings life. And the principle here is that the Old Testament law could show us our error, our failing, but it couldn't deliver us for us to be free. The New Testament, the work that Christ has come to do, transforms who we are so that we're born again. Now, because our who has changed, our do can change. So we are changed from the inside out, and that brings life. Oh, blessed be God. But we needed the law in order to show us that there's a difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. We wouldn't know there was a holy God, and we wouldn't know we were coming short if the law hadn't shown us. So the law made us ready. So when the answer, Jesus, arrives, we're ready for the answer because we recognize we need one. Nobody is interested in your solution if they don't know they have a and thus, it is important and incumbent upon the church not to adopt. Some people have gone um, to an excessive degree of what they call a grace message. And what they've done is the true grace of God is in the word. They have gone too far to the point where they say, don't tell people about sin. Don't say that what they're doing is wrong. But that's not the assignment of the church. We must tell people what the Lord said to tell. And that is, the Apostle Paul says that we must warn, knowing the terror of the Lord, we must persuade men. Our job is to go into highways and hedges and beg, compel people to leave what they're doing because there's a judgment for their sin. We have to call sin what it is because if the church ever stops saying anything about sin, then the world doesn't need a savior because it's only sin that has judgment connected. So if we talk about a savior and love and love and a savior and savior and love and love and a savior and never talk about sin and judgment, then our message of, of love and the savior has no impact. Oh, glory to God. And it's not for us to go about, as last week's lesson said, and establish our own righteousness. No, but we humble ourselves to the righteousness of God which is to warn people that sin has a complication. And that complication is condemnation. Its penalty is death. But the gift of God is life. And we'll be talking about that. Amen. Necessary. Oh, glory to God. Help me shout. Necessary. That we stay with the word of God. Glory to God. Look at verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death, now he begins to compare beautiful pictures using a Moses. He says, now, if the ministry of death, we just talked about that, that's the law, because the spirit uh, and, the, and the, the letter are different. He just said the letter, talking about the Old Testament law, that kills, but the spirit gives life. So then he goes on to say, now, if the ministry of death, which was the law, carved in letters on stone, symbolic, the Ten Commandments are a symbol of the Old Testament law. It's only one part of it, but it symbolizes the law. If the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was uh, being brought to an end, he's making a statement here. Let's continue to the next verse. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? What this is referring to is in um, the book of Exodus, we see that the children of Israel, they're in the wilderness. They've come out of Egypt and the Lord calls Moses up to Mount Sinai. And there, those first tablets, the Lord wrote it on the table of stone. Yes, he did. He wrote the Ten Commandments, the Lord himself. Well, Moses has those tablets. And having been in God's presence in such a phenomenal way, there was such a glory on, on, on Moses' face, the people couldn't look at him. Such a marvel. And this um, is somewhat of a picture of what we would see at the transfiguration of Moses and Elijah when they met with the Lord Jesus. And that's in uh, Matthew chapter 17. 
It was such a glory, such um, splendor. Oh, glory to God. Um, and uh, that was that was displayed. Amen. So, but Moses is, has this has this glory that people couldn't look on. This is Moses having been exposed to the law, symbolically by the Ten Commandments. And if that produced that kind of glory, also saying, well, what about the New Testament that brings life? Glory to God. Look at verse nine. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation. The ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory for truth, right? And now what is calling the ministry of condemnation, the law showed us our sin so that we were condemned. But it gave us no victory because it didn't change the person internal. Everything was external. Laws and activities and sacrifices and uh, uh, procedures and feasts and so on. It was all external. So there wasn't internal transformation. Being internally transformed, born again, didn't happen until the New Testament. So the law is called that ministry of condemnation. But the ministry of righteousness far exceeds it because that's a ministry that brings us to conviction oh, and to conversion, which is to change us. For the Lord is now in the New Testament, not bringing the condemnation for those that are willing to receive the truth. And we'll see that in a moment. So Old Testament versus New. Glory to God. Here in the New Testament, the ministry of righteousness, we are convicted and converted. Hallelujah. So marvelously converted, we're actually born all over again. Glory to God. Look at verse 10. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Uh, and so this is referring uh, to the picture that there was a glory of the Old Testament because it's still a law that came from God. There is a glory that came with it. But the New Testament has a glory that exceeds and surpasses. So he's talking about transitioning from the temporary to the one that's going to be permanent transitioning from the one that's of a lesser glory to one that's of a greater glory. Oh, bless his name. Look at verse 11. For if what was being brought to an end, the law, came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. And that is faith and grace. Look at verse 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Now, in some translations, they say there's plainness of speech. And what this literally refers to is there's no reservation, there's no hesitation, speaking freely, speaking confidently with assurance. And that's why the word bold is used. We can be bold because of what we know of what we have received, because we have a hope that is eternal. Oh, bless his name. Glory to God. <laughs> Look at verse 13. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Not only Moses had uh, this phenomenal glory of him, but it didn't last forever. It faded. And some say he veiled him his face, perhaps initially, because the people couldn't look on him. My God, because of the great glory on him. But ultimately, had the veil on so that they didn't see the glory fading away because that was a temporary glory that was uh, upon him. Amen. Glory to God. Picturing him representing the law, that glory would be temporary because a greater through the Lord Jesus Messiah would come. Oh, bless his name. So Moses put a veil in face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. All right. Because Jesus came and fulfilled the law and then established a new and living way. Look at verse 14. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. And now he's beginning to challenge the Jews who, even though Christ has come, even though he's lived, died, 
rose again, been on the earth 40 days after his resurrection, seen of hundreds and hundreds, seen of 500 in one occasion. And then there are other, I believe, 12 to 13, uh, 12 uh, to 14 specific post-resurrection appearances of Christ. All that's happened, We've gone back to heaven. All this has been manifested, all these miracles being done in the name of Jesus. Despite it all, their hearts are hardened. And he's saying they're staying with the uh, old covenant and their eyes are veiled or covered. It's uh, a symbol of spiritual blindness. And that spiritual blindness stays there because it can only be removed by Christ. Only Christ can take it away. My God. Now, looking at verse 15. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So not only are the minds blinded, but so is the heart. Hallelujah. The heart being hard is that resistance relating to the will. And there's often impurity that makes a heart hard. A mind being blinded is we won't receive the teaching. Uh, we're set in a certain mindset and not willing to let God renew the mind, which is what he wants to do. And so many have been uh, resistant against Christ and they're holding firmly to the Old Testament, but not acting on the very prophecy that the Old Testament made about Messiah coming and Christ Jesus is being rejected. My Lord, my Lord. Uh, look at verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the veil, symbolic of spiritual blindness, being in spiritual darkness, that takes away and only Christ can do it because Christ is the light of the world. Oh, glory to God. And very interestingly, of all the miracles that were done in the Old Testament, there were very many of them. Amen. Lepers were cleansed and the Red Sea opens and the dead were raised. But never in the Old Testament were the blind caused to see. The eyes of the blind were not opened until Jesus came. Glory to God. Symbolic that he, he alone is the light of the world. Now that he has come and he has assigned us to be his disciples, now he says, you're the light of the world. The church is. You're a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. So we are to carry the light. My God. Just like John the Baptist has said, I'm, they inquired, who are you? And so on. John the Baptist said, I'm not the light, but I came to bear witness or I came to testify of the light. And just like John did that as the forerunner, you and I as the after runners are to do the same thing. We're not the light, but we're bearers of the light. Oh, bless his name. And so that light takes away the blindness of man. It takes those in darkness and brings them into the light. Glory to God. And that's why we spread the gospel to take away the veil. Glory to God. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Some translations say liberty. And that is our Bible spotlight. Glory to God. Oh, this is beautiful and exciting. So freedom, freedom from what? Well, one person has described three Ps. And we know the thing that binds and enslaves is sin. And they have described how through the Lord, we are free from the power of sin. We're free from the penalty of sin. And ultimately we will be free from the very presence of sin. So let's look at those three Ps. The word of God does declare that we will be free from the power of sin. And we find that in Romans chapter six, uh, the whole thing's beautiful, but we'll just skip around and read verse two. Uh, we'll also read verse uh, six and verse 11 for reasons of time. This is New King James Version, verse two. Uh, actually, verse one says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since grace is available, maybe we should just continue in sin so we can use up all this grace. No, no, no. So verse two says, certainly not. God forbid that. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Glory to God. So we are dead to sin. So we don't live in it because we're free from the power of sin. Look at verse six. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him 
that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Oh, glory to God. Because we know we were slaves to sin and the devil was the slave master. But no longer is the devil our slave master. Instead, Jesus is our Lord. And no longer are we slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness. Oh, bless his name. Look at verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a blessing. Glory to God. So free from the power of sin. The second one is the penalty of sin. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, and Romans 6 and 23. Romans 8, 1 and 2, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who... Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Oh, bless his name. And Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even though we're guilty of sin, the Lord forgives us. And now, Instead of the penalty of sin, instead we have eternal life. Oh, how many know that's a wonderful exchange? Glory to God, free from the penalty of sin. And then lastly, we will ultimately be free from the very presence of sin. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 in the ESV. It says, or do you not know that the righteous, that the unrighteous, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unrighteousness is not going to be there. The unrighteous won't be there. It says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's not going to be there. Sin will be no more. And there are, of course, multitudes of sins, but these are just examples. None of this kind of thing is going to be there. Glory to God. Let's look over at uh, the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. And that they may enter the city by the gates. Only those that have washed their robes. And of course, it's in the blood of Jesus that the sin is washed away. And now the robes are pure and white. So only these believers can get in. They're the only ones that have the right to the tree of life. They're the only ones that enter the city by the gates, right? Those that have been cleansed. And it goes on to say, look at verse 15. Outside, they're not getting in, are the dogs. And this word dogs here refers to those that are godless and impure, those whose heart have rejected everything having to do with God. They've chosen a godless way and it's impure. So outside are those and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Uh, King James says everybody that loves and makes a lie, anything that's a lie, falsehood, none of that's gonna be there. Presence of sin no more. Why? God is the truth. The devil's a lie and the father of Nothing having to do with lies and falsehood. None of that's going to be there. Presence of sin, no more. I mean, oh, that's good news. <laughs> and Lord, we bless and praise you for it. Glory to God. Look at verse 18. Our final verse says, And we all with an unveiled face, the blindness has been taken away. We're beholding the glory of the Lord. And look what's happening. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Two beautiful things we want to look at here. Transformation and image. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 say, I beseech or I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice. All these other animals we brought they were killed, right? Their blood. The Lord's not looking for us for our blood. The Lord's looking for our living sacrifice. Live for him sacrificially. Giving up our way and our thoughts and our opinion and live sacrificially for him. 
Be a living sacrifice. Glory to God. So I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed. Don't fit the form of this world. To conform to a thing is to fit its mold. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So this verse has the veil's been taken away. We're beholding the glory of God and we're being transformed while it's happening. Minds renewed. Transformed by the renewing of the mind. We need a new mind. Bible says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We need our mind transformed. Glory to God. Glory to God. And we're transformed into what? Into the image. And it's talking about from glory to glory. What image? Talking about the image of the Son. Uh, Romans 8 and 29 says we're being conformed to the image of the Son. The picture here, the scripture also says we are God's workmanship. The, it's a picture of the Spirit of God is working on us. Here's an image, a picture of Jesus. And the Spirit of God is looking at us, looks at Jesus, looks at us, looks at Jesus. And there's some work to be done. <laughs> and he's working on us and conforming us, not to the world, but to the image of the Son. We got to be more and more like Jesus. Amen and amen. If you've never made Jesus your Lord, receive him right now. Admit you're in sin. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I leave my old life. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. He died and he rose again. He's alive. I leave my old life. I embrace Jesus to follow him all the days of my life. Join a Bible-believing church and serve the Lord. My brothers, sisters, and friends, remember this. The God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It's coming. God bless you. Until we meet again.